Hello, welcome to another Funky Marketing Show. Uh, today I have a pleasure to again talk with uh, with somebody that uh, I've been following a while, somebody who is doing a good job for the good people, sometimes for himself as well, somebody who recently became became a father, uh, a good a good human, and uh, you know, I just wa- I don't want to take. Um, much time to kind of present him but we're going to deep dive into the topic and today we're going to talk about demand gen uh with my man jonathan so jonathan welcome to the show awesome thanks for having me finally after something like a year of probably following each other on linkedin i think right yeah yeah something something like that you know i've decided uh when i started this funky marketing it was more like you know telling first the personal stories of the people Mm-hmm. that I interview, then I move kind of into, you know, if you're talking about specific things, but also emphasizing the things that are the background. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when I started doing that, I realized, okay, I don't need to have like uh, every time on the podcast, on the show, somebody that's like Rory Sutherland or, you know, those kind of uh, big old school shots. I can just interview people that I follow, that are talking meaningful stuff, doing good things. And, mm-hmm. you know, many of them, just like you, are uh, going really deeper, trying new things, tasting new things, and can share, uh, you know, uh, even a better perspective than many of those uh, those big shots uh, have. Mm-hmm. For sure. 100%. 100%. Uh, so, first of all, congratulations of, uh, again for being, uh, being a father, becoming a father. I think we are in that age, you know, when slowly yeah. talking with people and everybody are, you know, getting married or getting to the face when they are having kids and settling down and those kind of stuff. Yeah, I keep getting, uh, it's like, oh, another COVID baby. And I was like, oh, I didn't realize I was part of that <laughs> thing. I mean, it was just the timing of it all because my wife and I were thinking about having kids for quite some time. And you know, it just happened to be the time that we wanted to do it. But yeah, I think that uh, you're right. A lot of people right now are thinking about having kids. People, of course, got a ton of dogs and puppies and all sorts of things, right? Oh, because yeah. they're spending more time in their house. So uh, yeah, it's been great. Luckily, uh, I'm sleeping a little bit better and uh, things are getting better. But uh, apparently it's when they hit six weeks or seven weeks is when they actually start waking up. So we're apparently in this weird lull where... She's actually sleeping okay, minus like changing diapers in the middle of the night and stuff like that. Um, but we'll eventually get to be, um, you know, a little more rowdy. So anyway, I'm going to sleep now as much as I can until then. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good, yeah. man. While I plug in my laptop, I just realized I didn't do it. Uh, there are lots of stuff happening in Demand Gen today. And uh, I wanted to use this episode to kind of dive deeper and to explain people, you know, what is Demand Generation today? What does it mean? how it is changed and you know all those kind of stuff so tell me for starters you know how do you see demand generation yeah so i I think i have a wider definition of demand gen than most people have i think to your point like we were just chatting before we started recording uh demand gen for a lot of people is just a advertising or a marketing thing for me demand gen revolves around anything that creates and or captures demand period there's a lot of different tactics and strategies that are underneath that for example, a lot of people like to put side by side ABM and demand gen together as like two separate things. Oh, let's do demand gen as a strategy or ABM as a strategy. To me, demand gen is just the big umbrella term. ABM is something that you do underneath it to create and capture demand for a given set of target accounts. And the same is true for lead gen and all the other different types of things that we roll out from a program's perspective. So for me, it's really as, as simple as that. And um, of course, the other uh, little wrinkle to that is to me that sales is also a component of demand gen. Uh, Demand gen, I mean, SDRs are sending out emails, they're A-B testing different messages that work. Uh, 
they are coordinating, hopefully, with marketing on the same target account list that they're trying to go after uh, in those different ABM campaigns. So sales is equally a part of demand gen for the org. And I think that's where people are now starting to potentially relabel. And everyone likes to create new names. I, again, just love to keep things simple. Um, but there's like revenue teams, revenue growth teams, et cetera, that encompass sales and marketing. But at the end of the day, demand gen is all about creating and capturing demand. So. I totally agree. Um, mm -hmm. I like to do that as well. Uh, in fact, like uh, while I didn't start doing that, uh, like not many people reacted to what I was talking about on LinkedIn. You yeah. know, when, when I saw that I need to simplify things, that's where the growth started to happen. Because like some of the things, you know, we are in the game for years and some of the mm -hmm. things we, we take for granted. And oh, yeah. for some of the people like, moving from, uh, you know, lead gen models to doing something else, which we call now demand gen, it's like revolution in, in marketing because they didn't ever see anybody doing it differently. And, you know, exactly. I needed to accept that and realize the, those facts. Yeah, exactly. I think most people at the end of the day, I mean, they want to go after the 3% of people that are in market. They want to capture that demand and they don't want to spend time trying to actually generate or create demand for their products because it does take more work and it takes more time. And when you've got short term goals, you start leaning into things where you can capture results right away. And of course, as you know, all too well, this is the reason why there's an underinvestment in the dark funnel and why a lot of those things get um, really pushed to the side and people end up just spending the majority of their budget on search or even SEO, I'd say, and Legion uh, forums doing gated eBooks all day long on LinkedIn. And they don't have any other type of marketing that actually talks about what their product actually does and the outcomes it drives. And I think there's just such a huge opportunity. I think there's some great companies that I think do a better job of this. I'd say, you know, Clearbit's one that stands out for me if anyone looks at some of the advertising that they do. Uh, they do a really good job from a product marketing perspective that not just says the feature of what they do, but really describes like, hey, how, what is it? And then how can I benefit from it? And I think that that's a huge opportunity for demand gen marketers is to start separating themselves like, okay, yeah, we're building the top of the funnel. And I'm not completely against gated content, mind you, um, but we need to build the top of the funnel. But at the same time, we still need to kind of take a step back and say, what is it that we actually do and make sure that people understand that? Because the majority of things that I see on LinkedIn are so high level, so out there, and maybe they're interesting, maybe they align with me or not, but I'm still wondering like, I don't even know what this company does. And without digging into it, I'm never gonna know. So we need to get in front of that message. Yeah, and it takes us back to the very beginning, you know, get to know your audience. And 100%. There, there is this thing when we, you know, kind of make, make the, a difference between capturing demand and creating products for already existing demand and creating products uh, and, for demand that isn't there, you know, mm -hmm. and many, many times, like looking at the SaaS companies at the tech companies, they are creating new products with new technology that people don't know that it exists. Mm -hmm. So, so they are not Googling it. They are yeah. not looking out for that specific solution. But then again, you know, uh, if you ask them and they know that they have a problem, they will just give you the answers that are already out there. Mm -hmm. they don't know that anything else exists so you need to get edu get them educated about the things right and get them to the to the level when they can aha this thing exists so this is what you do this is how we help you solve the problem which is totally different than what you have seen so far agreed and i'd, I'd say one thing I, I totally agree with what you just said i'd say also this that if you're just playing the game of search, you're, you're too late. People, people are already discovering and learning about products before they search for them on the majority. So we're seeing people that are hearing about that product on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, or someone on, somewhere on a social site, maybe in a community or through a friend, et cetera, or even a podcast, lots of different other areas. And then they're going to search to read more about either that company, look for comparison products, understand more about the category, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're over invested in search and you're not doing enough work on the paid social side or organically, either or, uh, then you're going to miss out because all the people that are putting in that type of energy are going to drive far more uh, leads and also pipeline of revenue through those, those channels. And what we see is a lot of times when you start increasing the budget and or starting to post more organically to an audience where they're going to be receptive to your message, you'll start seeing more volume for different searches on Google if you're playing search 
and also branded search conversions increasing because people are more aware of who you are and what you do because you've done a good job, hopefully, in those channels of describing what your product does, the outcomes it drives, who's using it, and all of those good things. Yeah, that's that's well said because, you know, things have changed, especially in the last year and a half or two, or and they're yeah. still changing because uh, people now, uh, you know, go to different places to get educated, to look for advice, to kind of learn. You know, we didn't have podcasts before. We can use them to get to know our target group. We don't even need to talk with them directly mm -hmm. sometimes. You know, then we have different kind of communities related to the marketing, to the sales. Even, you know, like what I'm seeing for companies that are targeting developers or engineers or those kind of things, there are groups on this court where are gathering around board games. Or some other stuff that you know have nothing to do with engineering, but like mm -hmm. they are, in a way, they are nerding out on board games because they like playing board games, and you know mm -hmm. you need to go deeper, know those things, and then you can you know you can start from there and kind of see aha, this is our target group, that's what they're all about, and this is when they are moving, when they are spending oh, yeah. time. Yeah, there, there's there's email groups that I'm part of where people say, have you heard about these three vendors? And what's your experience been with these three vendors, right? Those conversations are happening there. And that's where people are getting feedback from people that have maybe used the product before or other products and then making decisions on which products they actually decide to work with, which is another reason this is a little bit of a segue, but it's another reason why I'm just such a big proponent of making sure your website does a better job of actually describing what your product does, showing videos. For example, I really love uh, Six Sense on their resources page. They have a place called The Dojo. And in that, they have a whole series of videos that are very, um, I would say, just buyer led, like just straight from like the, the persona of who's actually gonna be using the product. And they do a really good job of just saying like, hey, this is how I wake up every day and use Six Sense. Here it is, I go in and I do X, and then I do Y, and then I do Z. That's and I great. think that's so powerful, you know, to help kind of reduce friction, help people understand what the product is because there's still so many B2B SaaS companies that are hell bent on hiding aspects of their product because they're worried about what competitors are going to do with that information. But the reality is back to your point about communities and other places is that people are going to discover learn about your product and find the answers, whether you give it to them or not. There's people that clearly are using your product today. So if your pricing page isn't transparent, they're going to ask other people, what's the pricing? What did you pay? So they're going to figure it out. They're going to talk to people like, hey, can I see how you use the tool? And they're going to get on a podcast or they're going to get on a quick Zoom, et cetera. So all these things can be figured out um, on, on other channels. So instead of letting your customers sit there and talk amongst themselves, why not get in front of it and offer up that information and make it just so incredibly easy to buy on the website. So something that, that I think about a lot. Yeah. Uh, it looked like I think lots of people started to talk about intent on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. And in most cases, I'm like reading it and thinking of me as somebody who is like old school SaaS guy. And I have no idea what the hell we are talking about. Uh -huh. You know, like... Inten what's now an, an intent? Like, where does it happen? Why do I need to think about that, that thing? And I want to get deeper and uncover a little bit those things. So uh, why do we need to go before the intent and actually, in most cases, build the intent? So, uh, you know, we are not already late when people have decided what they want to go, uh, who they want to go with and what they want to buy. Well, I mean, a very simple answer is that you're going to max out or tap out your available pipeline, the number of target accounts. There's only so many people that are aware of, of your company or aware of the category that your company represents, right? So whatever signals you use and whatever intent and provider you, you use and how that's set up, there's only going to be a, a certain portion of people that are actually in market. To continue to grow your company and to have more people that are coming into that intent category, you have to invest in making people more aware. And if you're, if you're spending all of your marketing dollars on the three or 4% of people that are actually in market, you're missing out on the 96, 97% of the people that haven't heard about you, maybe haven't heard about the category as much if you're a new category creator. And it is your job to actually start creating uh, awareness for your product. And if you don't, what's going to happen is the people that in that category that do are going to be the ones that are remembered. 
it's going to be their brands that come up. And when it's you versus them, they're going to be thinking of that other brand because they were the ones that were spending months over months over months providing valuable content, whether organically or through paid or through a podcast or whatever means. And they're going to think of that brand and come to them. So that's that's the biggest reason why you start doing that. I'm, I'm definitely a proponent of leveraging intent data where we can get SDRs and sales reps to focus more on the right types of accounts that do have some level of intent. I think it makes perfect sense. And I have seen the, the rates of conversion increase when we start focusing on the right fit accounts. But from a marketing perspective, we can't say that's the only thing we're doing. We have to do more than that because that's going to run out. There's not an endless supply of people that are going to have intent for our product. Yeah. And, and look like those people that uh, already know about us, they know about the problem. They know about us. They know that we can solve their problems. I mean, in most cases, those people will buy whether we do something or not. It's sometimes even better that the salespeople call them so, you know, mm -hmm. they can get them to, to buy faster, maybe. Oh, yeah. You know, but I see as like the marketing job is to get those people to that point. Mm -hmm. When they know about us, when they get are educated, they are aware uh, of the way we can solve the problems. They are aware of the differences between us and the competitors. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and they know that we are the ones that, uh, that have, can help them solve the problem. And when you do that well, when they get on the call with sales, sales is not going to have to defend themselves as much of why are you different than all of these other competitors? And they're not going to have to defend themselves on the typical objections if marketing's done a really good job of explaining what those things are. So I think that's the huge benefit. And sales will feel that very quickly and be like, holy shit, like these leads, like these people that are coming in right now are like ready to go. And I think like that's the reaction that I'm always looking for as a, as a marketer is, you know, when I'm talking to a fellow salesperson or someone that we work with, all the different B2B SaaS companies we work with. I'm looking like, what is the reaction and what's the emotion from sales with, with respect to the last few months? Are they feeling more confident? Is it getting easier? What are they saying about the quality and like getting some of those qualitative insights? Because if I start hearing that, like, wow, like they're really excited to actually, you know, follow up on some of these because they're just easier than going out there cold. And like now we've, we're, we're doing it right, you know, and we need to keep pushing on the gas and do more of this. Yeah, exactly. I, I remember the, you know, the excitement of, uh the sales team from one of the companies we work with and mm -hmm. like they were uh they were trying to reach huge accounts because they were they were selling like um safety devices so mm -hmm. you know if they have a hospital or or you know um uh, a college or you know a huge uh, a huge uh company no matter if it's public or private they can sell them at least 50 devices Mm -hmm. And before us, they were kind of, you know, selling, okay, maybe 10, maybe 12, something like that. But when those accounts, when they, when they saw like, aha, uh -huh, this is this hospital, this is this one, this is this one, like we can sell yeah. them at least 100 devices. They're like, oh, I can't wait to get on the call with them, you know, to kind totally. of dive deeper into those things. And you'll see those other lag indicators. I'm sure you saw this for your client too, but when we look at it too, we'll see sales cycles drop by more than 50% in some cases where, where marketing, and this again is not a, you do marketing for a couple of weeks and a month and then automatically like, where's the sales cycle decrease you talked about and where's all the pipeline, et cetera. But we'll see more than 50% decrease in sales cycle length. We'll see increases in pipeline usually within three to six months of over 60 to 70%. So like all of these things like start happening again, as you start doing marketing the right way, which we can kind of get into some specific tactics and channels and whatnot. Um, and, and of course, sales to our point, you know, earlier is going to start saying like, wow, like I really want to talk to marketing and figure out what they're doing more versus being um, a distrusted. And I was actually in the position, I mean, my background's kind of interesting because I came more from a sales background before I was, I was an SDR in the AE before. And I was the person that was actually receiving some of those leads. And I remember how it was when, you know, they were running gated ebooks and all this stuff and they wanted us to follow up on them or close or webinar leads, event leads, things of that nature. And I was the person that was going to make all those calls with all these people. And uh, none of them wanted to talk with us. Um, I mean, every now and then maybe there was like, you know, one or two, but I mean, majority didn't. And what that created is like every time I knew they were going to throw me another list, we started ignoring it. 
And that created a that created a lack of trust that we had with marketing. Like, oh, these guys just are going to throw us another stupid list that we've got to go after, and it's not going to go anywhere, right? So, so then, so that's the that's what happened in a lot of B two B SaaS companies, and what marketing, if they're in that position, needs to say, okay, well, we need to start changing our relationship with sales, and it's not just about getting together in a room and talking about what they're doing. This is about doing better marketing so that when the leads come in, they're better quality, they're better firmographic fits for. Uh, for them and they're easier to close. And if that happens, then sales is going to be more open and more receptive to working with marketing. And I think that's how it happens. It's not just by getting together and doing a powwow. I think a lot of people think it's just all about, we just need to tell them what we're doing. We need to partner together on what we're doing. Like, yeah, those things are important, but make sure that ultimately the best thing that you can do for a salesperson is give them a hot lead that wants to ultimately buy from the company. Yeah. I mean, doing your job because uh, yeah. we, we, de we defend marketers a lot, but like I still think today most marketers are doing the lousy job mm -hmm. and not only inside the companies, but also as agencies and other stuff. Like my background is in, in agencies and in startups and mm -hmm. I can, I can totally see, you know, how things are going, you know, applying the same playbook for every company, uh, in-house marketers, you know, being satisfied. Okay, I'm creating those events, like I'm posting on social media, I'm creating webinars, and that's it. You know, mm -hmm. they have these leads, they have people who have been on this, they can do mm -hmm. with them whatever they want. I have done my job. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but I think it, it has a lot to do with, you know, in the past, we couldn't actually measure marketing the right way. We didn't have the mm -hmm. technology. So mm -hmm. we measure them on leads, actually the C-level mm -hmm. executives measure them on leads. And then when you measure them on something, it increases over time because, you know, you, you expect results yeah. and then you care only about the numbers. But today I think, you know, we can track everything. We don't need an email from somebody to know that he has done something on the website. Hmm. Or, or anything else, you know, to kind of uh, see where they are in the in the in the buying cycle and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. We we have all kind of tools to help us out with that. And you know, having in mind all of that, like in my perspective, marketing moves up in the company mm -hmm. and you know sits uh, on the table with sales, with uh, with all other departments. And it's kind of interesting because you know, oftentimes something who is head of sales is in that conversation marketing isn't but mm. marketing is touching every point in the company every department because everybody's mm -hmm. doing marketing 100 mm -hmm. percent. yeah it's not just a marketing's marketing's job to do this i mean you can look at gong and see what they did in their sdr and sales org by encouraging people to create their own personal brands of course sarah brazier is one of the more popular ones but there's a lot of other uh, good people on the Gong team that I know that have created just awesome stories around driving demand for Gong uh, just through organic posts and telling what they're doing every day. I mean, literally, that's it. And they're driving demand for the business. So this is not a marketing needs to generate more demand for the company. This is 100% a sales and marketing thing. And frankly, I would just go as far as just saying really the company, but at minimum sales and marketing to start generating some of that content, put some perspective out there, have an opinion not just, you know, post out, you know, your corporate, you know, article that the company put out on a blog, you know, if you want to talk about it, you know, read the blog and then have a perspective on it and then give your two cents because people want to know what you think. They don't want to know what, you know, the company thinks. So I think that's important. The other thing too, that you said that was interesting was uh, the measure of success. And I'd be interested in getting your thoughts on this as well, because I think that the measure of success is one of the most important things to get right from the beginning because if two teams are measured differently, then you're going to get widely different tactics, strategies, and results on either side. And wondered what your thoughts are on that from a measure of success standpoint, because I think that that really starts to make a big difference in all of the things that happen. And if you don't get that right, then that's where you lead into a lot of these problems that we're talking about right now. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Because like, you know, it all depends on the, where is the company and how marketing is developed. You know, usually from, from the start, what I'm seeing uh, that is working is kind of just giving marketing a sales perspective. Mm -hmm. So aligning them on the sales goal and look like, guys, this is our goal. You know, what can you do to help us? While you develop, you know, the trust and everything else inside the company so marketing can take over, uh, you know, and uh, do things a little bit differently. Uh, but, but then as everything develops, 
I mean, you know, marketing is the one in charge for creating the pipeline, mm -hmm. uh, decreasing the CAC mm -hmm. and, you know, and being responsible for the, for the part of the revenue. That's how, mm -hmm. how it should go eventually. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, to add, to add to that, I mean, I think, you know, my perspective on it is that so many of the issues that are created that at least a lot of myself included and others uh, have complained about is that, you know, the, the, the nature of, you know, generating, you know, tons of gated eBooks and putting them out on, you know, on LinkedIn and Facebook, having an SDR follow up with them through an aggressive sequence, et cetera, and trying to close them into, you know, a lead pipeline, et cetera. All of this, for me, really results from just a lack of alignment and the measure of success being different for yes. both teams. So that's why, again, you know, it would be almost irresponsible in a way that if the measure of success for a VP of marketing is to generate leads and they don't have any responsibility really for pipeline and revenue, it would be irresponsible to stop doing some of those typical lead gen strategies and gated ebook, right? Because yeah because that puts their job in jeopardy. We don't want to, I mean, if you're the VP of marketing, you're not going to be receptive to a message where, hey, move away from gated eBooks, move away from lead gen, move away from all this. We need to really start investing more in the dark, dark funnel. We need to start opening things up. We need to do more product marketing on paid social, or organic, et cetera. So I think that's why the most important thing is getting right the measure of success from the beginning. And that will set all of the various strategies and tactics that are used down, whether it be from sales or marketing standpoint, so for, for at least most of the B2B SaaS companies, and not all of them, mind you, most of the ones that we work with, we try to do our best to work with VPs of marketing who are already aligned with pipeline and revenue so that we can do marketing yeah. in a way that we would prefer versus running the same types of strategies that frankly, 90% of B2B SaaS companies are running. So just a, a point there. Yeah, I mean, you just said what I, what I said before is, you know, you cannot put the same playbook for every company. Yeah. There are different things. People are in different positions. And, you know, people managing teams or departments, there's always this, you know, balance that they need to, uh, to, to carry. Mm -hmm. You know, from one side, they have the board, the founder, CEO, whoever it is demanding results that they consider relevant. But on the other hand, maybe you have marketing team that is listening to, you know, to us, to Chris Walker, to somebody else. And, you know, they want to implement something else. Let's try to change things. But then, you know, you are in the middle and you need to balance those things and kind of, if, if, if needed, make the, 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 you know, the soft transition from one to, to the other. Sure. I mean, whether it's Chris, you, me, whoever in the demand gen space that says that this is a specific strategy or tactic or thing that you should be doing uh, versus this, you know, someone actually posted this literally just this morning. I forget. I think it was Sarah, someone or another, but she was uh, saying, you know, do you trust what people say on LinkedIn? You know, for all these people that are saying all this stuff on LinkedIn, whether again, Chris, me, I include myself in this hundred percent. Um, do you do you trust these people and what they say? And, um, you know, I thought about that for a second. And I think my comment around it is that I don't think you should take anyone's advice directly of what anyone says on on LinkedIn or any other social channel for that matter. You should still say, let me internalize and understand what this person's saying. And then let me see if I understand what the context is around what what they're saying. And a lot of times there's not enough context. There's just not enough space on LinkedIn and a post to give that level of context. So immediately where I go is, all right, well, if I like what this person said, it sounds interesting. I want to learn more about it. The best thing to do is just reach out to that person and say, hey, I'd like to get a little more context around, you know, who this strategy was for you know, what maturity this is best for type of company, et cetera, because taking any advice immediately from any one of us automatically off of, off of LinkedIn is very dangerous. So you still need to say, all right, where's my business today? And what's the context of this advice? And once I understand these things, then we can say, all right, now we can implement some of this within our organization. We can try these things out. And I think that's, that's where at least I, I know I, I criticize myself on this to say, you know, Hey, just because I said this doesn't mean that's what you should do. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, you know, often when we post on social media, we need to go a little bit extreme just to kind of get people to react mm -hmm. to it. Sure. So, For sure. you know, it, you need to kind of, you know, I, I like to polarize people because mm -hmm. like that makes them think 
and then it makes them, you know, defend, uh, you know, their standpoint. Mm-hmm. And, and I like those people, you know, I can get into the discussions and go and like, I, I dislike that, you know, on LinkedIn, not many people disagree because mm-hmm. that would be great. Mm-hmm. That That's a space for a great conversation. That's how the whole community moves forward. But mm-hmm. I think like, you know, like everybody can see what, what you're liking, what you're commenting uh, and that kind of, you know, makes people think for a second if they're going to add a comment or no, you know, but. Why do you, why do you think that is? Why do you think people choose not to, to disagree as much? Conflict I mean, it, avoidance? It, uh, yeah, I think definitely that. And, you know, um, definitely because lots of companies are still, you know, living in uh, the time of a couple of years ago when they overlook what their employees are writing on LinkedIn, mm-hmm. what they're commenting, you know, those kind of things, uh, which means that they don't have the right culture. They don't hire people for the right things. Uh, mm-hmm. And, you know, they don't trust them. Mm-hmm. I mean, it comes, it comes to that because uh, everything that's happening on LinkedIn or other social media, wherever outside of the company is just the extension of what's happening inside the company. And mm-hmm. that's how, I mean, Gong, uh, I don't know, Gravy, now Chili Piper, that's how their employees are now, you know, doing great things on LinkedIn because they feel satisfied that they work for the company and they mm-hmm. are empowered to do those things. And, you know, that's that's what I'm saying also. I work uh, a lot with companies that, you know, want to develop kind of hub inside the company and to help them, uh, you know, uh, use LinkedIn the right way and, it, and if the strategy is going to work or not, always comes down to, you know, if the leaders are involved, how involved are they? And, you know, are they involved enough that people trust them and, mm-hmm. you know, are with them in these are the things that we uh, really need to do? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think and I think trust is built over time, too. Right. I don't think anyone, whether it's a CEO, founder, et cetera, immediately just, you know, has trust within a within a network of people. They they immediately start sharing some perspective opinions or something valuable to uh, to a group of people and they continue to connect with new ones. And then over time, the, that group of people, as they uh, better understand that that person's perspectives here's what they've done. And they've done that over a period of time that starts to build trust. It's the same concept of of marketing in general. Frequency builds trust. The more times that I see a specific name, the more chances I'm going to remember that name and then then, uh, trust that name. So when I get an email from that person or that company, I'm going to be more likely to respond. So the same thing's true about you know, the repetition of being out there. And I think, you know, on, on LinkedIn, whether it's LinkedIn, Facebook, et cetera, it's interesting that you and I are kind of rifling off some of these names. There's something like what, 5,000 MarTech vendors out there. Yeah. And I bet you, if you and I thought about it, I think we could only name maybe five to 10, somewhere around there of the ones that we think are very active that are top of mind for their given categories because they're active on LinkedIn. Now, of course, LinkedIn has very active sales and marketing professionals, right? So a lot of these companies are there. But the point is, is that what's happening to those other 4,090 companies that are not even top of mind in any of our brains right now? And the reality is that like they're just not participating in some of these communities and they're not participating with the people that, you know, have a following or people that um, people that are just talking about the same types of topics within LinkedIn. So I think that there's a huge opportunity still for those companies to take on. I think the question is, you know, how do we avoid measuring it so critically in a month's period on that resulting in a a sale and instead say, hey, this is something that long term we think is the best for the community because this is going to add value and push people forward. Yeah, let's let's use that to kind of move on into some you know, specific things like tactics, strategies. And Mm -hmm. uh, I like to use everything that you said to kind of go straight into the advertising, for example. Mm -hmm. Like when I I think at, you know, creating demand threads, I I look at it as an extension of uh, or imitating the organic engagement, Mm -hmm. kind of what we are getting there. So you mentioned trust, how many times we appear in the feed, for example. But... If we don't take care of the creative, uh, of the visuals, and don't add enough different elements, like people will hate us, as the, as it happens on a personal level. 
you mm-hmm. know, like, oh, this man is annoying. I'm seeing him everywhere. <laughs> it's it's yep. the same with, with companies. And uh, so I like that, uh, you know, kind of tactic when we go and through ads, we um, get sort of news like articles when we present all kind of things we are doing. We hire the new person. We are working with this company. We achieve these results, you know, just to kind of always be there on top of mind. But then add things like uh, we talked about the products, about the thing. It's not about presenting the product. It's about how the product solves problem, get mm-hmm. different perspective on it as well. And then, you know, like who has been using the product, how mm-hmm. has been their experiences, those kind of stuff. It can, if we can share those stories, actually, if our clients and customers can share those stories, that would mm-hmm. be amazing. That's kind of how I see the, the ad structure. And then, of course, like you always have this, uh, you know, capturing demand where you're actually saying, man, I, uh, I make you aware. I educated you. I saw you the benefits of the product. I saw you how we are different. Now it's time for you to buy it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think uh, maybe I'll just kind of point out some some highlights so we can go in a mm-hmm. different direction if you want to. But I, I think that, like I said earlier, what I see in terms of what most people are doing on LinkedIn is running, again, top of funnel gated ebooks. 90% of people are doing that. Most of the creative looks exactly the same. Yeah. So when you're looking to stand out and you're saying, all right, what are we going to do on LinkedIn? And again, let's not focus too much on LinkedIn because the same thing happens on Facebook, too. Um, but you know, when I see that immediately, what I'm thinking is, all right, well, I don't want to do the same thing that everyone else is doing, because how am I going to get that brand to stand out if everyone in the feed looks the same and has similar types of creative. So that immediately means, all right, from a creative perspective, in terms of what it looks like, whether it's a video or a static image, I need to do something that stands out. That's a little bit different that catches someone's attention. And that's all I need. I need just a couple of seconds or microseconds to capture someone's attention. And then from there, the big thing that we're trying to do a lot more of is, you know, because we know that generally, you know, 98, 99% of people do not actually click on the ad. We're trying to make sure that to your point, you were just said it earlier, but from a story's perspective that we're really telling enough of the story without needing to actually pull them to a website for them to ingest more information. If they want to, that information's there. But for the majority of people that are not taking that step, let's at least make sure they can internalize and get some piece of the message right from the creative. And then ultimately, once they maybe have been warmed up over a period of time, they'll actually click and come in uh, via the ad or many times just go direct. They might just come type in the URL. Um, They might go into our LinkedIn company page and click our company page and come in that way. So uh, they might uh, come in organically and come back through Google. Uh, So there's a lot of different ways. Uh, which is why, again, we can get into attribution because that's always a fun conversation later. But um, but I think that that's, that's the key thing that I think that we're doing a lot of. The other thing, too, that I think is a huge opportunity, again, like I said earlier, is uh, from a product marketing perspective. There's so much that can be done there um, to bring about uh, more consideration of like what the thing actually does. And I'm not talking about high level abstract statements or something like that that say like live free, live tomorrow or something. And like, well, it's like, I still don't know what you even do. You know, like, yeah. what is it that the product does? That's what I always find myself like these like lofty branding statements. Like I, I still, I'm like, okay, that sounds nice, but I don't, I, I'm still not sure really what you're, how you're going to help me. And, and maybe I'm just a little, you know, practical, but that's the way that at least we try to approach it for all the companies we work with. So I think that that's a huge opportunity and just describing that, telling a story, whether whatever format you want, static image, video, uh, you can use uh, customers to tell that story for you in very authentic settings, kind of like you and I are talking right now. You know, like I don't have some amazing background. We don't necessarily need to make this all graphically oriented. We can still just have you and I talking about something and share that with someone so that they can get a little bit of value from it. So I'll stop myself there, but there are two things that immediately you know come to mind with respects to just some opportunities I see from an advertising perspective. Yeah. Um what what i would say i think we didn't mention it you know it comes down to that not uh did the people convert from the ad Mm -hmm. but you know did we distribute the right information to the right people at the right time you know and you mentioned also you know we want to give them just a a a little part of the story sometimes Mm -hmm. and that's that step that we need to deliver them 
depending on in which state of the of the buyer's journey they are. So just enough for them to move to the next to the next step. Mm -hmm. And yeah, 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 exactly. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Uh, I was just thinking uh, one other thing too that I, I see a lot of times is that uh, a lot of times people want to you know market to everyone that's in the 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 buying committee. You know, and it's like, well, but the VP of finance also has a part and the supply chain guy is a part too. And this person has a part as well. And everyone has a part. And then they say, you know, it's like, what's your budget? And then their budget's, of course, not nearly as much as it needs to be to get the level of frequency and distribution across all of those different personas. They don't have the content to support it either. Um, so then we're left with saying, OK, well, let's just send something that we think all of them kind of like. And let's do that on, a, you know, on sometimes a shoestring budget. And let's see what happens. And the reality is then you just get a muddled message that really doesn't apply to really anyone. And uh, the frequency that's really not going to get you far enough for them to actually internalize the message. So another thing that I think is a huge opportunity building off of your point regarding uh, target account lists and making sure you're going after the right people is, is reducing the number of people that you're actually targeting from a persona perspective or segment perspective and go heavier in on those groups of people that ultimately are going to be the ones that say, yes, I would like to talk to someone in your sales organization. Yes, there's other people that are going that are over here, VP of finance, VP of supply chain, whatever those other titles are that are going to need to weigh in. But we need to drive some of the initial people that are going to start starting those conversations. And then, yes, we can do other things to start hitting those other people. But that allows us to have a much clearer message. It allows us to get more spin to a, a smaller group of people because remember, I mean, everyone, I mean, I'm not sure your audience on this, but you know, a ton of people are going after the same segment of people. So, I mean, you've got thousands of other people that also want the attention of the eyeballs from this group. So ultimately it's going to be the person that has, you know, the best message that really resonates with that, that group of people versus kind of saying, Hey, we know we need to hit them all. So let's just kind of find a, a, a broad message to hit them with. So, so I'd add that to your, to your point as well. Totally, totally agree. And it got me thinking, you know, like you cannot just target the decision makers. There are yeah, other people no. who will, for example, use the tool or the service. Mm -hmm. And there are others who can influence those two. So, mm -hmm. you know, like, and that's why we are connecting with different people on social mm -hmm. media platforms from the target accounts companies you know it's not just targeting those types of people but going even wider getting into discussions into communications because especially in today's market you don't know who's gonna work for each for which company in a week mm -hmm. like that that's that's how crazy it is today and that's how i'm seeing but tell me a little bit uh mm -hmm. i've never done the reddit uh ads i see that you <laughs> guys are doing it tell me something uh interesting about it I can tell you this, actually, uh, it won't be, I guess, as interesting, but I can tell you that we've, we've run it for a handful of clients and that uh, ultimately has not been terribly successful um, uh, from a Reddit perspective, at least with the companies that we've worked with. And I'm sure there are some companies where um, the audience that you're trying to go after on Reddit could be potentially very impactful. But uh, from a Reddit perspective, we have not had um, much success. Uh, we've started doing started getting a little bit into TikTok here and there uh, with certain companies, but again, still staying with kind of the primary platforms that end up, you know, really providing most of the engagement where our, where our buyers are, because ultimately, I mean, all of this is about this. I mean, there's a lot of platforms. I mean, there's I mean, tons, tons of platforms. There'll be new platforms. We will probably be in the metaverse at some point in the future and virtual world, looking at billboards and all sorts of other things like that from an advertising perspective, but ultimately it comes down to, you know, where is your audience? And if your audience is hanging out on LinkedIn, well, then you need to be on LinkedIn. Again, for sales, marketing, recruiting, a lot of those titles and others, you know, LinkedIn's a great spot to be. For, for other uh, folks, maybe developers, engineers, et cetera, possibly Twitter, Reddit, or other communities, Quora, et cetera, could be very interesting platforms to look at. So I think it always comes back to experimenting. For us, we just haven't had, um, enough of the target markets that I think would really resonate with, you know, the platform with the folks that are really on, on, on Reddit as much. Um, and also we've just been kind of early on. So I don't know, have you had any experience with Reddit or anything that's uh, kind of juicy insight for your nah, clients that I marketed mean, on there? Uh, just like organic and we had different, um, you know, different reactions. We were trying a lot and kind of try to see how the community over there is working in different subreddits. Because it's mm -hmm. different, you know, it just makes you uh, realize that depending on the platform where you're distributing the content, 
you need to do it in so many different ways. Like some subreddits just want you to submit the link and don't tell anything. Some of them mm -hmm. want you to mm -hmm. describe the topic. Some of mm -hmm. them want you to engage, you know, uh, on a certain level. Then you have uh, the ability to post anything. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can see that how much effort is needed, you know, to get into the community and get mm -hmm. into the way they are functioning, they are thinking, so you can actually share your point of view. Well, I think that's a great point of why, you know, when you've got a lot of people at your company that are also uh, posting organically or sharing content organically, that what you do from an advertising perspective dramatically starts improving because people are now uh, very familiar with your brand and the people. Because again, in LinkedIn, people generally follow people like you and I or others or people at Gong or whatever company. They want to hear from those people and what their perspectives are. And then they go to their profile, they see where they work, and now they're familiar with, okay, yeah, I know that they work for this company, et cetera. So that when I see something uh, from an advertising perspective, whether it's content or, or whatever the message is going to be, I'm kind of like, oh, what is this? Because I know that girl or I know, you know, Sarah who works at this company. Like, I'd be kind of interested because I like what she says. I like what she says. So maybe I'll like what the company's saying. And I think that that's such an important piece. One of the biggest things that's, you know, we've talked about it, I guess, enough on this, but, you know, having a, a strategy organically, uh, not just saying, hey, paid's going to be the only thing that's going to get us there. All of these things need to work together. Paid alone is not not a good strategy. You need to have some of these other elements to make paid more effective. Uh, so, so yeah, uh, agreed. Yeah, I mean, um, often, and I, I repeat that on a couple of episodes, and I talk about it with, uh, I don't know if you know, Yak, mm -hmm. account-based marketing conversation podcast. Yeah, he's a good mm -hmm. friend of mine. We talk every yeah. day, but like, his favorite book and one of my favorite book is uh, Influence from Mr. Cialdini. And mm -hmm. it's, you know, learn how to influence some people. And mm -hmm. it will give you a lot of new perspectives today because it all starts with that. Mm -hmm. uh, but tell me, tell me uh, one thing. What, except ads, maybe, okay, we... For the SEO, maybe we can we can say that it's good for capturing demand, right? Or uh, I have something missing for that part because I think like lots of people mix it up. Some of the some of the companies consider demand gen as advertising. Some of them goes to to SEO, and actually it's all of it. Like it's advertising, it's brand, it's organic. There are all kind of components in it because the buyer's journey is not linear. It's, it's all of it. It's, it's like you said, I mean, from the, they're going to pull it back for everyone. I mean, demand gen, at least for me, again, lots of people have different definitions, but it is a broad based uh, term um, for creating and capturing demand. And ultimately all the things that you just mentioned fall underneath it as different tactics and things that one can do, whether that's SEO, posting organically, a podcast, getting involved in community communities, advertising, whether that be legion or brand awareness, all of these things are going out there to a specific target market to say, hey, I've got a message, I've got something to say, or here's a piece of valuable content that I think can really help you, et cetera. So I think that, you know, for those folks, they have to, um, you know, just think about it that way. And again, remember that, again, sales is part of that, you know, whole whole picture too. Marketing doesn't need to do this in a silo way. They can pull in the sales team and say, hey, this is what we're doing. And here's some ideas that we think would really help you ultimately meet your goals because usually marketing teams are fairly small. A lot of the B2B SaaS companies we work with, I mean, we're talking, you know, three to seven, eight people a lot of times. So with a marketing team that's that small, you know, you, you just can't get this type of scale that you need and where, where you have sales teams that are usually double, triple that amount and a lot of, you know, higher ACV enterprise sales motions. Those people can have a huge impact to influencing uh, some of the folks in these channels. So. Yeah, uh, I wanted to to get your insights, uh, you know, on one thing for the end, because not many people mention customer success mm. and, you know, uh, that team. And in my opinion, that's the team that should actually, uh, you know, bring alignment between marketing and sales because mm. they are the one talking with customers uh, all the time and they need to be a part of the conversation, you know, mm. with mm. everybody. Because, you know, they have the data. Mm -hmm. Usually, okay, sales has the data as well, but customer uh, success is here with them every step of the way. And 
most of the times they are also doing interviews with mm-hmm. with customers. So um, what's your perspective or like where the customer success has a place in everything that we are talking about? Yeah, I think they, they 100% have a place. And I think the place that they have is that what they're seeing is that sales has, of course, talked to the customer a lot. They've, they've heard all the objections. They've uh, heard the types of things that the company wants to do with the tool, et cetera. The customer success people are actually seeing what they are doing with the tool and the different types of use cases that are yeah. actually driving a more a bigger impact for their business. And hopefully if they're very good, customer success managers, they're setting a baseline of where the company was at the beginning and then coming back to that person three, six months later, whatever is a realistic time frame for that business and saying, where are you today and what has changed since using that product? So I think customer success managers can have a huge impact on what we put, produce out from an advertising perspective with respects to case studies and really just like helping not only the sales team understand what the top use cases are of how they're actually using the tool, because a lot of people, there's there's a product that has a billion different features, right? But ultimately, the majority of people are using, say, three, four different things, and they're using the tool sometimes in different ways than the company's actually selling it as. So there's some really great insights that you can pull from customer success to not only for advertising, but then for the website too. And then say, hey, look, like a lot of people just really want to use like these three core things. So let's push more of these harder from an advertising and marketing perspective. Yeah, they're going to check the box on some of these other features, right? Because everyone always does that. But Mm -hmm. ultimately, they're deciding to move forward with the product for these three things. And we need to make sure that we're really well known for these three things, especially if they're differentiators in the market. And one of your other competitors doesn't really offer that type of use case really well. So, so yeah, hundred uh, percent, they should get involved. And um, yeah, I think between all three of those groups, there can be great conversations. Love the perspective and the points I can tell to uh, everybody who's listening. Like we had an episode talking about how can uh, B2B companies become uh, media companies mm-hmm. uh, with Selman Gokce when he actually uh, said the way their customer success and product teams are doing the interviews with the customers and getting you know, how do they uh, call the products? So they, they changed the name of the products based based on that. Then they saw that they can rank for many different categories because, mm-hmm. you know, uh, they don't have the specific thing that customers call them. Mm-hmm. Or like the product is the one that is giving insights. Uh, so they took everything to the CRM and then like mm-hmm. marketing and sales are taking that and impl- implementing that in the way they, they go to market. You know, mm-hmm. and uh, so it can be a lots of different things that, that can be done. But what's mm-hmm. important is, you know, that we should think uh, not about only about acquiring customers, but also about retention, about keeping them and increasing the lifetime value. Because like it's always cheaper to, to increase what we get from the existing customers. 100%. Totally agree. Man, uh What's the one thing that you want to say to people that can take away from these episodes? I mean, for, for sure, they, they need to go back to the start and, uh, you know, listen to everything that we already said, because I think we go, we went step by step and said lots of uh, good things. But what's the one takeaway that, uh, that you want to share? Don't do what everyone else is doing. I mean, literally to add a little bit to expand to that, I mean, literally, if you if you have your whole entire category doing the same types of things on the same types of channels, well, then you're just blending in with everyone else. So it's it's all about standing out and whether that's from a creative perspective, whether it's about doing just different things, launching a podcast, some of your competitors are not doing, getting involved in organic community, et cetera. It's all about standing out and contrasting against what, what's the norm. So when you see someone else, one of your competitors doing X, Y, Z thing, it's not, hey, how can we copy this and kind of put our, our colors on it? It's to say, okay, they're going that direction. What can we do that's a little bit different that allows our market to see us as a, as a differentiated product from those other products out there? And I think that's honestly one of the biggest things. If people did that, um, it would take them away. The last thing I'd say uh, to maybe end it is that ultimately all of these things you know, roll back up to, like I said earlier, aligning the measure of success. And a lot of times that just has to come from the CEO, the board and everyone up at the top. Uh, So the best job that everyone can do is make sure that ultimately the closer they can push their CEO and their board to have the same measure of success aligned, the better they'll be actually able to do some of the programs that they've been thinking about. 
if they don't have that, those measures of success aligned, you will continue to have distrust with, with, uh, with the sales team. You'll still have problems about meeting pipeline and revenue numbers for the sales team. They'll be missing their quotas, et cetera. So ultimately pushing that, you know, uh, you know, pushing that conversation forward. If you're not an org that has the same measure of success, I think is going to be the biggest thing. And that'll allow all of us to work together ultimately on the same goals. You nailed it. Yeah. Uh, man, thank you for yeah. taking time, uh, you know, for, I'm sorry for keeping you away from, from your daughter and everything else, <laughs> enjoying, enjoying the, the parenthood. Uh, thank you for, uh, for being here with me. Thank you for sharing, for sharing insights. I'm sure that we'll uh, repeat it in, in the next, the next months and oh, talk yes. again about the things because things are changing so fast and, you know, we need to catch up on everything. Uh, guys, Make sure to, to connect with Jonathan on, on LinkedIn uh, on, in any other places. Like uh, We'll leave the, the links in the description of the episode. And, you know, whatever question do you have, feel free to ask not only Jonathan and me, but somebody else. If you see something interesting, as, as he said, go ahead, ping them and, you know, get them on a... 10, 15 minutes call, just get their perspective on the things mm -hmm. and then see if this is the right thing for you to apply or no. Have to get the context, 100%. Totally agree. Yeah. And for the end, uh, keep it funky as always. <laughs> That's the ultimate message. Bye-bye, guys. Good. Okay.